Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a comparison between the Sony A1 and the Canon EOS R5. Now, before we get into all the specs and giving you my opinions on it, I have used these things in the real world extensively, so I have hands-on experience to report back to you which cameras get the check marks, which ones don't, and which one I think you should go with at the end of the day, if either of those are an option. Now there's been a lot of talk when people compare these two cameras where people are like, you shouldn't be comparing the A1, it's a flagship to the R5, which isn't called a flagship and it's less expensive. But as you're gonna see from the specs, the R5 lines up pretty well with the A1 for the value, for what it costs. And that's the most important thing. And that's why I'm putting these side by side today to tell you which ones get the check marks and which ones don't. Now let's start with some of the specs. Let's start with the sensors, starting with the A1. You have a 50.1 megapixel full frame BSI stacked. CMOS sensor powered by dual Bions XR processors. Now that is an important thing to remember that you have a stacked CMOS sensor that's very similar to what they had in the A9 and the A92, which allows them to get super fast readout speeds and super fast autofocus, but that's also what you get when you have dual processors. Now on the Canon R5 front, you have a 45 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor powered by one digit X processor, which is the same one that you find in the 1DX Mark III. Now, yes, it's a 45 megapixel sensor that isn't stacked, but it does a very good job as you'll see when we get to how many frames a second it can shoot when it is in silent electronic mode. But having just one processor versus two processors, does that matter? Honestly, I can't tell you because I don't know if Canon's processor is super duper more powerful just by having one versus having the two inside of the Sony. I can't give you a check mark on that side, but if I'm giving a check mark for a sensor technology right now, I'm going with the A1 because of that stacked C CMOS sensor. Moving on to ISO, we've got a native ISO range of 100 to 32,000 on the A1, and then we have on the R5 a 100 to 51,200. You can go a little further natively with the Canon. Now I've pushed the Canon upwards of 16,000 ISO when we did the real world review, and it looked like noise. It looked like grain, to be honest with you, and I do not mind grain. Uh, uh, by the way, I do not try to do away with grain. I don't use any smoothing software. I don't use any denoising software. I prefer to just stick with the noise in the grain, just like when it was with film, because to me, I rather have an image that's sharper with some grain than an image that is smoothed out that gets rid of the grain. Now this is a tough one to tell you which one has better high ISO capability, but the fact that you have 45 megapixels and you could push this thing up to 16,000 ISO, in my opinion, without a problem, I don't really expand to the 20,000 ISOs. You never really find myself in those ranges, but I did shoot the A1 in that when shooting football at uh, 20,000 ISO, and it was perfectly usable for whatever you wanted to use it for, to be honest. So in this case, I don't think I'm giving a check mark to anybody. I think they both handle extremely well. And the surprising thing was when the R5 came out with 45 megapixels, generally you don't think that it's gonna hold up at higher ISOs, but it did a fantastic job, and the A1 does a fantastic job as well. Now here's where we get some differentiation. It's the frame rates. With the Sony, you have an anti-distortion shutter giving you up to 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter. You can do that with 12-bit compressed RAW. So whenever you go into the 30 frames per second, you are compressing the RAW to 12-bit. Now if you shoot in the 14-bit uncompressed, you can get 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. Now you only get 10 frames a second with the mechanical shutter. Now you might be saying that 10 frames a second with a mechanical shutter, that's not that much. I can do more with other cameras and the truth is that you can. But Sony at this point is saying that the future 
is shutterless. We are not gonna have shutters in future cameras and you're gonna see that for the fact that you can shoot up to one two hundredth of a second and get a flash sync with the electronic shutter in this camera. That is unheard of, you couldn't do that before, but you still have a mechanical shutter because you can get up to one four hundredth of a second flash sync with this bad boy right here. But keep in mind that this camera is built around being silent. It's about being an electronic shutter and just using the technology of that stack sensor to get a super fast readout. Getting that super fast readout means you're not going to get any bowing or if a, a, a golfer is swinging the golf club, you're not going to get any of that rolling shutter effect. It's going to be minimalized and you won't really notice any issues. Now there is something inside of the A1 that is pretty unique and it's you can set variable shutter speed. So like 1 2 50th 0.237 of a second to try and counter any flickering or any lights that you may encounter that may cause an issue. You have anti-flicker with the camera. Most cameras have that today, but this lets you dial in shutter speeds that if you're shooting video or you're shooting stills where you can dial it in to the point of the flickering of the lights so that you can get great shots. And to keep piling on to the frame rates, you can shoot up to 1 32,000th of a second with the electronic shutter. That means if you're shooting with the Sony 51.2 G Master and you're like at 100 ISO at 1.2 and you're like, but I, it's so bright because we're letting so much light in, you could just keep dialing that shutter speed up to 1 32,000th of a second to compensate for how much light you're letting in. You can't really do that with anything else out on the market. So so this, in terms of frame rates and options that you have, is a fantastic little setup. Let me jump in here real quick to show you Fropack 3 in action on this picture taken with a Canon camera. Let's start with Fifth Element. Then we've got Canadian Tuxedo, followed by Capone. Just look at what Capone does. It's pretty insane how well that one works. We've got King Contrast, followed by Mentos followed by Mount Airy, and then check this one out, Prestige Worldwide. We created 15 all new custom Lightroom presets and you just saw a bunch of them, even with just one click, they give you a great starting point as well as speed up your raw workflow. To check them out right now, head on over to fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you wanna pick up Fropack 1, 2, and 3, you can save even more with the Fropack Triple Play Bundle. Now, let's get back to the video. Now let's move on to the R5. You can shoot at 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. Now you do top out at 1 8,000th of a second. So that means if you're using the 51.2 RF and you're at 100 ISO and you're at 1.2 and you can't stop down any further and you can't speed up that shutter speed, you may have to move into using some ND filters uh, to compensate, to cut back on some of that light. Whereas with the Sony, you can go up to 1 32,000th of a second. But when this came out, the R5, and you knew you had 45 megapixels and you're doing 12 frames per second or 20 frames per second with the electronic, that is pretty insane. Now you may run into some issues with the 20 frames per second shooting silent because this is not a stacked sensor. So the readout is slower than what you're getting from the A1, which means if you're shooting that golfer, you may get a little bit of bowing in that club. And some people that shoot sports have noticed some issues with the flying ball. So if you're throwing a football, you may have noticed that it's a little bit on the warped side. You're not going to notice it too often, but it is something that's there. But still, 12 frames per second mechanical is better than what you have in the A1s, 10 frames a second mechanical, and 20 frames per second with 45 megapixels was really awesome until they came out with this, with the A1. But it's still really awesome because when we get to the price, you're gonna notice the difference. But who gets the check mark in this one? Who, who? Sony's getting the check mark uh, for this bad boy because of what it can do with that stacked CMOS sensor. Moving on to mounts, we have an E mount on the A1 and we have a RF mount on the R5. There's just so many words and acronyms and so many different cameras that sometimes my brain slows down. But you have an RF mount, which is fantastic 
for the Canon. You have a lot of pro options. You've got a 28 to 70 F2. You've got the whole entire Hebrew Trinity. You've got a lot of things hopefully coming in the future. You don't have that big ass white glass just yet. The 300s, the 400s, the 500s, the 600s, the 800s. You don't have that just yet, but you really don't. Actually, you have some of those on the Sony front, but the biggest differentiator between these two systems is the fact that Sony has third party support. You've got Sigma, you've got Tamron. Does that matter so much when you get to the A1, something that's the higher end? Not as much because it really matters more on the lower end with more affordable 2.8s or 1.8s and 1.4s. But in this situation, we do have the 51.2 that you can get on this. That's the first time they had a native 1.2. But on Canon's front, you have an 85.12. You've got the 51.2. There's like a 35 f2 macro, which is pretty affordable. You even have the 51.8 plastic fantastic RF version. You have a lot of great options. I would like to see third party support come to the Canon. That would open it up to a lot more people with more affordable options and lenses. But but geez, right off the bat, if I had to choose which system I would want to go to if I was starting today, I would probably, it, it, from a pro standpoint, not looking at third party glass right this second, if I was starting today, I would jump on RF glass all day long. Now it's expensive, but it is solid. It is a great, Canon did a fantastic job right off the rip. Their bodies weren't very good when they came out at the beginning with the R and the RP. They were good enough but the glass that they focused on is fantastic. Now on Sony's front, they have what, like what's it, 61 or something G, G lenses? So Steven just told me 61 lenses. They've done a great job in six years or so to fill out their lineup of glass, but some of their stuff is a little long in the tooth. Like the 70 to 200 2.8 is bulky, expensive, and doesn't hit very well continuously with autofocus, and that one needs to be replaced. But their 35 1.4 and the 50 1.2, the 135 uh, 1.8 is fantastic. Their 85 1.4, not so much. That needs to be replaced. Uh, if I got to give a check mark in terms of mount, I'm going to give the check mark on the Canon side because this RF glass is revolutionary and I expect some more fantastic fast glass in the next couple of months. To add to that, even though I already gave a check mark, we're going to have to give another check mark to Canon here because you can adapt older, what's it, EF, yes, EF, so many acronyms, EF, RF, Z. Oh my God, so much stuff. But you can adapt your old EF glass like I did with a 402.8. I adapted that to the R5 and R6 and shot football and it was fantastic. You can adapt the 70 to 200 2.8 Sigma. So you have a lot of options for being able to adapt a lot of older but still quality glass on this body. Now with all of that being said, I do have to point out that if you're using some of the Sigma or Tamron third party glass on the A1 and you think that you can get 30 frames per second, you may not get that because of the focusing motors inside of those lenses may not be able to keep up with that speed. So you may get 15 frames a second. I don't know the exact number. I don't think anybody knows the exact number right now, but just know with those third party lenses, you may see a slowdown in your ability to shoot super fast at those 30 frames per second. So let's give an extra check mark over here to Canon for adaptability. Now let's go on to focusing points. The A1 has 759 phase detect AF points that gives you 92% coverage. Uh, it has real-time tracking, IAF, animal AF, touch and drag AF. It has a lot of stuff going for it. The autofocus is so fast and so sticky. It is fantastic and amazing. I've been loving using the Sony since I switched over about two years ago with the A7R4, and that's what I took on the road with Bernie. Uh, head on on to BerniePhotoBook.com to check out my Bernie photo book information. Do that, that's a short little plug for me. But it was fantastic in a real world situation for that. This for shooting sports, this for shooting photojournalism, it's been sticky. It's been amazing. The autofocus that Sony has created is top notch and really hard to beat. But with that being said, the R5 will give you 1,053 face detect AF points that cover 100% of the frame. That's edge to edge, top to bottom, left to right, BA, BA select start for 30 men in contra for two players. Two players! And I'd still lose before my brother even got out of the second go around. You know, when I hit those lasers, I constantly hit up and I get bzzz, ah, and I die. He's like, stop doing that. And I'm like, I'm trying, but I'm really bad at video games. Anyway, um, you've got dual pixel AF2 
fantastic. You've got lock-on tracking, IAF, Animal AF. You can do way more with the Animal AF with the Canons. For whatever reason, Canon did a fantastic job with their animal tracking and IAF. When I was shooting the R6, which has the same focusing system as the R5, tracking some birds coming at me at the uh, the Renaissance Fair, I was amazed that literally I just frame it up and it found the eye. It did a better job than what the A1 can do. So that's something that Sony really needs to catch up on is, is that IAF, because that's something that a lot of people want for shooting nature and then this camera could be perfect in those situations. Let me cut in here and say, are you tired of your friends and family looking at your photos and saying, these are amazing, this is the best thing ever, but you really wanna get a professional's opinion and feedback on your photos? Well, let me be your mentor. Head on over to fronosphoto.com slash mentorship because I have two different options you can sign up for. One is for a 15 minute recorded rapid fire critique of your work. And the other is for a one-on-one -on -one 45 minute Zoom call with me where we go over your work and I give you the honest, truthful feedback that you're looking for. So if you want to sign up right now, head on over to fronosphoto.com slash mentorship to reserve your spot. Now, let's get back to the video. There is touch to drag AF, there's focus guide and manual AF, which is, Steven uses that all the time. It's where you can go into manual and then you get these squares that line up and they're triangles that line up and you're like, oh, I'm in focus. It helps you with the manual when you're doing that. Now, the reason I said that this is a toss up is because, I mean, Canon came out of nowhere with the R5 and the R6's autofocus. They went from kindergarten all the way up to graduate school really fast. And using this, I would just, I wouldn't even have an active autofocusing point when I'm shooting sports. I would just be like, boom finds what I needed to find on, locks locks onto the eye, locks onto the face, does a fantastic job tracking, and they did a great job. And with the Sony, it still does a fantastic job. But the insane thing is, I'm sitting here going, which one's better at this point? And I can't tell you which one is better at this point. What I can tell you is, if this Canon was in my bag and that's all I could shoot with, I would get great results. If this Sony was in my bag and that's all I could shoot with, I would get great results. I just really love what Canon did with the, the graphics when you're doing the autofocus, the, like the colors around the box. It just seems to be sticky and does a really good job, but I'm not giving anybody a check mark. Actually, let me take that back. They're each getting, how many check marks should they each get, Steven, to make it hard on Dan? Eight million. Eight million check marks. So that's four million over here and four million over here. Fantastic job. Let's talk about the dual card slots you find in both of these cameras, starting with the Sony, you've got two CF Express Type A slots that are backwards compatible with UHS-2 SD cards. On the Canon front, you have one CF Express Type B slot and one UHS-2 SD card slot. Now, personally, I prefer my slots to be exactly the same. I like two, two of the same slots at all times. This having those CF Express Type A card slots that are reverse compatible with SD is great. But if you're going to shoot with two cards, and I shoot redundant to both, so I have all the RAWs going to one and all the RAWs going to the other. That's almost like a uh, that, that Billie Eilish song. All the bad girls go. I, I can't sing Billie Eilish. She's different and unique with her singing ability. It's better than me. The, the, the cards are smaller, but they're much more expensive. If you're buying this camera, you're gonna fork over a lot more money because you have to buy the CF Express Type A cards. I'm telling you, if you wanna shoot at the 30 frames per second, you want the right speed that you get with those CF Express Type A. If you wanna use the SD cards, you're gonna be waiting for that buffer to write a long time. I do not recommend it. Now keep in mind, you can do redundant video recording with these two slots on the Sony, you can't do redundant video recording with the Canon. So you can't write the same video, you can't back it up. So it just doesn't let you do that. But with the CF Express Type B slot, that is a super fast writing and reading card. So fast, you never outrun the buffer. But what happens is when you throw an SD card in there into the SD card slot, it now dumbs down the faster writing of your CF Express Type B slot because you have a slower SD card uh, writing capability in it. So now 
you're not getting the same effect as if you had two of those. I prefer having two of the same slots. I wish they would have done that in this. So I'm giving a check mark in terms of slots over here to the Sony because you got that dual writing to the same cards for video and for photos. Since we are talking about memory cards, let's talk about the buffer that you have inside this camera. With the Sony, you can get 155 compressed raw files, which is about five seconds of shooting at 30 frames per second. If you're one of those people that holds down the shutter for five frames a second, please raise your hand. If you hold, you, you out there, you raise your hand if you hold down the shutter for five seconds. Next, take an open hand and slap yourself because that is not how you should shoot. You should not be doing that. I do not condone violence unless it's against yourself, which I still do not condone violence at all, even against yourself. I take it back, do not slap yourself. If you already did it, I'm sorry, I'm apologizing. Don't slap yourself, okay? All right, moving on. You can do 82 uncompressed raw files in a row before filling up the buffer. Um, that means you're shooting at 20 frames per second. You're not gonna outrun this camera unless your finger gets stuck on the shutter, which from time to time, I feel like I'm shooting and I don't even realize I'm shooting. So I really wish that any of these, hey, anybody out there making cameras, can you give us some haptic or haptic feedback? Like somewhere, maybe in the palm, it just like, bzz, 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 like buzzes me so that I know that I'm actually shooting. I need some of that feeling going on there. All right, Canon, we can do 180 uncompressed raw files to the CF Express type B card slot and 87 if using the SD card slot. So if you're doing redundant, you're getting 87, but you will not outrun the buffer in this. Uh, buffer capacity, no check marks to anybody. Let me jump in here and let you know that this video once again is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, I highly recommend that you check out squarespace.com slash photo to get your 30 day free trial. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, let's get back to the video. Moving on to video, that's right. All these cameras do video. If you've been sleeping under a rock, especially Fraggle Rock since the 80s, You'll be amazed to know that, look, these are hybrid cameras. They're mirrorless. They don't have film. They also shoot video. Let's talk about the specs. The A1, you can shoot full frame, 10-bit, 422, 4K, up to 120 frames per second with pixel binning. Now you can shoot in APS-C mode and get 4K without the pixel binning. Moving on, you could do full frame 10-bit 4208K UHD video recording up to 30 frames per second, which is oversampled from 8.6K. You can record all 8K options to the SD cards, which is awesome. It has a heat dissipating structure with no overheating and unlimited record time. Those are a big deal because a lot of people are like, the R5, it overheats. We need to get out a fire extinguisher, which we keep right over here next to us, just in case something ever overheats, which it generally doesn't. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second. But having the ability to shoot unlimited time in 4K and from a lot of people's tests, be able to do the same thing with 8K, even though they say there is a time limit, that is a pretty good thing that you can do right there. Also, you have a full-size HDMI port, which is great. You can do 16-bit raw video externally, redundant recording to both of the cards, even if you're shooting in 8K. So it's a pretty stacked camera. I mean, it's a stacked camera, obviously with the price, it better do quite a lot of stuff. Now let's jump over to the Canon. You can do full frame 8K DCI 12-bit raw video recording up to 30 frames per second. You can record all 8K options to the SD cards except raw or all I. You can shoot 4K up to 120 frames per second at 10-bit 422 in H.265. You got 4K oversampled from 8.1K with no pixel binning as long as you're in the 4K HQ mode. Speaking of 4K HQ mode, that's what we're shooting in right now with two Canon EOS R5s. We've been shooting with about six of them in the studio here since they came out, and we've been loving the 4K HQ mode. Now, we generally can shoot up to an hour continuously before we get the warnings or we can't shoot any longer, and the camera's like, hey, it's time to turn off. Is that a big deal? In some situations, it could be a big deal. Like if we're shooting a new video guide and we're shooting for hours a day and we want to shoot it in the best quality mode because we love the 4k that's oversampled the HQ mode is great then that could be a potential issue but we hear a lot of people saying that it's unusable 
No, it's highly usable. And we use it for like 90 some percent of what we've shot so far without running into any overheating issues. Now, when we've gone to shoot things that are longer, where we've done two or three hours of recording in a fairly quick amount of time, which three hours isn't a fairly quick amount of time, we've taken it off of the 4K HQ mode and just do the 4K mode. And we can see somewhat of a difference with the video quality. We like the higher quality better, of course, but if we need to film for a long amount of time, that's what we've been doing here. Now, rumor has it that there may be a cinema version of the R5 coming, which would add a fan, which would then allow you to have somebody cheering you on at all times because the fan comes with it and is like, you're doing great, you're awesome. But if it was a YouTube commenter that came with it, it'd be like, you suck, go home. That's what they would end up saying. So with that being said, I know a lot of people are gonna be like, well, I have R5, should I be upset? And the answer is no. Fantastic camera. We love the video options that we get. We love the 4K HQ mode. But who gets the check mark? This is, this is a super tough one because you could shoot with both of them and get great quality. Um, I'm gonna leave this one unchecked. I mean, it, it's, a, it's honestly a toss up. It comes down to personal preference. Moving on to image stabilization inside of these bodies. The Sony will give you five axis in body stabilization up to 5.5 stops of compensation. Now you do have an active mode for stabilization, which is very good, but it adds a slight crop, which I'm not a big fan of slight crops. Now on the Canon front, you have five axis in body stabilization up to eight stops of compensation with certain lenses and seven stops with most lenses uh, that it, when it pairs with IS lenses. Uh, in this one, we, we're going check mark on the Canon front. Their stabilization, when paired with those new RF lenses, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. EVFs, the thing that you look through when you have a mirrorless camera, the Sony has a 9.44 million dot EVF with a 240 frames per second refresh rate. There's zero blackout. It has a new pan shoot mode, which is actually pretty good. It's like, Peter Pan, where are you? Tinkerbell. You know, you press a button and it's like, now you're in Never Never Land. But that's what it's called, right? Never Never Land? Yeah. yeah. And then Rufio comes out and he's like, Rufy. Oh. Thank you, Steven. That was a little slow, but Steven did, did catch, he's paying attention to the cameras. But active pan mode is pretty good. It allows you to see what you're doing as you're panning and shooting, which is not something you, you with every other camera, you gotta take the picture and then see if you did it. This. Boom, it slows it down and you see you're panning live in front of your eye. That is great. Onto the Canon EVF, you've got a 5.7 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. Honestly, it, it gets harder and harder to tell the difference between these EVFs. I really like the way that the Sony EVF is. It's nice, it's like looking through a window. It's really good. The Canon one is fantastic as well. And the fact that the Canon one sticks out further from the back of the screen is definitely a bonus from the back of the camera. The Sony has gotten better. It used to be much, uh, closer to the to the back, uh, being flush on the back of my nose, my schnoz would get smushed up against there too often, and I really don't have that big of a nose, all right? I really don't. But EVF-wise, I, I, I don't know what to say, check mark here. They're, they're both really, really good. So which one would I give the check mark? I mean, on paper, the A1 is a fantastic system when it comes to the EVF, but in the real world, I don't, I can't really tell much of a difference, so no check marks. Are you thinking of purchasing the A1 or the R5 or any other camera gear for that matter? Well, use our affiliate links down below in the description because they help us continue to make these types of videos. Moving on to something where a check mark will be delivered in this one, the screens. We've got a three inch 1.44 million dot tilting touchscreen on the back of the A1. Some people may be upset that they can't vlog with, I want a vlogging screen, I want to rotate it. Well, screw you. You don't need your vlogging rotatable screen in a 60 some hundred dollar camera. But what we would like in a camera this expensive is a much better LCD screen on the back. It is still pretty garbagey. There, I said it. There goes the Sony money truck. It's backing up. It's rever actually, it's driving away. It's no longer backing up because I said that, but it's actually true. On the Canon front, you have a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot very angle touch screen that does rotate. It does everything. It is a fantastic option. I don't care about the rotating screen, but some other people do. In this case, check mark is going to the R5.
Now let's talk about the Wi-Fi connectivity of the A1. Of course, you've got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.0, as well as an Ethernet port built in. Now with the R5, you got Wi-Fi, you got Bluetooth 5.0, with an optional wireless transmitter, battery pack grip vertically thing, which is right here. So you can purchase this, and you then right now have an Ethernet port off the side of it. That is a nice option that they've added. Now you do have to spend more money to get this, so that brings the pricing a little closer together. This is a thousand bucks, right, Stephen? Yeah. Holy shit, this is a thousand dollars. I even didn't talk about the prices yet, but that makes this almost, this little kit here, probably five grand with tax. So take that into consideration when you're doing it, but at least they have the option. Check mark is going to the Sony. Moving on to battery life. Well, with these cameras, I do highly recommend that you get the grips for the cameras so that you could put dual batteries in there, but also be able to shoot vertically and just feel like a real photographer, you know, instead of being like, the I shoot under, the, the shoot under thing still makes no sense to me. But let's talk about the battery. In the Sony, you have the same Z batteries that they've been using for a long time. You've got USB-C charging. And of course, I just said that you have the grip available. The battery life in this thing is fantastic. You put two batteries in there, you're not gonna outrun it for a long time. And then you can just have two extra in the bag just in case you do outrun it. Uh, you're probably not gonna do it. I don't think I've ever run out of battery power on a photo shoot, even when out on the road when using this thing on the Bernie Trail. I didn't run out of batteries throughout that entire day. On the Canon front, you've got the LPE 6NH battery. You can also get the grip and you can also do USB-C charging, which is actually what we're doing right now when we use the cameras. We plug into an anchor brick because we didn't want to spend the money. It was like, what, like 300 bucks? How much is the Canon one? 150 for the Canon and it's like 37 bucks for the anchor USB-C charging grip. Yeah, uh, power brick. I put that into the wall and then I plug that into the camera and that's how we keep 100% on the the batteries at all times. So who gets the check mark this time? I'm not giving a check mark again to anybody because it's too hard to tell you which one's gonna be better. A lot depends on your usage. Are you using the LCD screens? Are you shooting a shit ton of photos? What are you gonna do? You're shooting a lot more video. It all varies on your use. I don't think you're gonna outrun it with two batteries in the camera. You shouldn't have an issue. So no check mark there for anybody. Now let's talk about the weight and the feel of the bodies. The Sony weighs in at 1.61 pounds or 737 grams and the Canon weighs in at 1.6 two pounds or 738 grams. They weigh about the same. They also both feel really good in the hands. Back in the day, I thought the Sonys felt like garbage in your hands, like the a7 III felt terrible. It was blocky, the rubber didn't feel good, the button position didn't feel good. When they came out with the a9 II, the a7R4, and this A1, it now feels great. Of course, the a7 S3 as well. Those all feel great in the hands. Sony did a fantastic job finally getting it right and Canon got it right with their cameras right out of the box originally with the EOS R. It felt good in the hands. Were some of the buttons in weird places? Yes, that touch sensitive thing was stupid. That was a terrible idea that we said you should get rid of and they did get rid of it and this camera feels great in the hands as well. Buttons in great places, touch screen works really well. Uh, everything about it feels great. So I'm not gonna give a check mark again to either of these because they both feel great in the hands. And finally, price. This is the big differentiator. We've got the Sony cracking in at $6,498 and the Canon is priced at $3,899, which makes it $48.99, $58.99, $68.99, minus a couple hundred. You're looking at $2,600 different uh, difference unless you get the grip, then you're looking at $1,700 difference. Uh, that is a big difference. Now, remember when I said this is a flagship model and the R5 is not considered a flagship model? Some people keep saying that, oh, you should compare it to the R1. Guess what, the R1 doesn't exist at the time of making this video, so we don't make videos based off of cameras that don't exist when we wanna compare specs because they're not final. When they're final, we'll put it next to the A1, and I think people are gonna be pretty surprised to see what the R1 can do. Now, I don't know what it can do just yet, but I'm thinking that it's gonna be pretty darn good. This is a thumb. This is a thumbs up button. Smash it! Now, I put these cameras side by side because of how well the R5 
does with all of the specs for $2,600 less than the A1. You today would need to decide which way do you wanna go. I'm gonna go with a check mark on one of these and I'm gonna tell you in just a second. When it comes to shooting stills for me personally, I'm giving a check mark to the A1 right now. If we had a bunch of A1s in the studio, I'm sure we could use them for video, but we decided to go with R5s before the A1 even came out, but it's also a little more cost economical to go with R5s in the studio because they're $2,600 less for us when we are shooting video. That makes more sense for us, so we're gonna do a check mark there for us shooting video. But honestly, at the end of the day, the R5 is in a great position to compete against this A1 for the majority of people out there. Because if you're not the White House photographer who is now shooting Sony, who I believe is still using A9s, not even A92s, they may have gotten him some A92s at this point, you're not one of these wire photographers that's running around uh, like AP photographers, they all switched over, AP switched over to using all of the Sonys. They love it. They shoot silent. They wanna get all those frames per second and they don't wanna make a lot of noise. You can do that with the R5 too and I think you'd still do a comparable job. I think these are very well aligned cameras with a pretty big price difference of 2,600 bucks. At the end of the day, which system do you wanna go with? If you're already in bed with Canon, you stick with the Canon because when they do come out with the R1 or whatever their flagship is, it's gonna be expensive and it's gonna be very well received next to this. At least that's gonna be my guess. It's gonna be expensive, but it's gonna do some fantastic things. If you're already in bed with Sony, then stay in bed with Sony. Just don't get caught with like Nikon or Pentax or something because it wasn't me. Like. We weren't loving on the bathroom floor or anything. I'm sticking with the Sony side for now. I could see at some point if that R1 is just so darn fantastic and the lens choices are, are there for me, I, I could see doing that. But I hate being in this position right now where I think about this because back in the day when I couldn't afford to jump systems and I shot Nikon, I stuck with Nikon. I reinvested into that system nonstop and I stuck with it as long as I could and now I'm in this position where I'm lucky enough, knock on wood, to get access to this type of gear to have the first world problem of trying to decide what to go with. If you're a Nikon shooter, oof and you're trying to decide, maybe wait till that Z9 comes out. But at this point, it's your personal preference to decide which way you think you should go. What do you think? Send me a text, the number's up on the screen, or let me know down below in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Poland, Fronosphoto.com. See ya.